Welcome and thank you for joining us for the Center of the Study of Slavery and Justice Spring 2023 Fellows Lecture Series. My name is Cheryl Tony Holly, and I'm a Mellon Visiting Fellow in Slavery and Justice as part of the Mellon Foundation's Reimagining New England Histories Project. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that Brown University is located in Providence, Rhode Island on lands that are within the ancestral homelands of the Narragansett Indian Nation. The Narragansett Indian Nation, whose ancestors stewarded these lands with great care, continues as a sovereign nation today. We commit to working together to honor our past and build our future with truth. We also recognize that the university was built on the enslavement of Africans, as well as on the dispossession of indigenous people. Recognizing that racial slavery was central to the historical formation of the Americas and the modern world, the CSSJ creates a space for the inter interdisciplinary study of the historical forms of slavery, while also examining how these legacies continue to shape our contemporary world. This afternoon, it is my honor and privilege to introduce CSSJ, Visiting Assistant Professor, Dr. Max Scott, for his talk entitled, I Am Not Yet Turned Indian, The Narragansett, Roger Williams, and the Discord That Created Rhode Island. Dr. Scott is a historian, educator, and member of the Narragansett Indian Nation. His work focuses on the intersections of race and identity and employs agency as a lens through which to view and understand the voices, stories, and perspectives of traditionally marginalized people. Now, as Dr. Scott is talking, please feel free to submit your questions in the chat. There will be time at the end of the discussion for more questions and answers. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Oh, thank you, Cheryl. And um, thank you everyone that is here online and for your interest in uh, my work. Um, as Cheryl said, I kind of use agency as a lens, which means that I'm trying to uh, understand the history um, that's usually not recorded by understanding what people did, right? So as we go through the, the talk today, you'll see a lot of that, right? Inferring from actions of indigenous peoples. Um, but before I speak, I like to uh, remind everyone uh, that uh, I speak for myself as a scholar and not for the Narragansett people writ large. Um, for uh, anyone that's for multiple, lots of reasons, but for anyone interested in learning more about the history and the continued presence of the Narragansett people, please visit um, the nation's official website. Uh, I think we'll put it in the chat here, narragansettindiannation.org. Um, you will also find lots of information about the Narragansett um, at an indigenous owned and operated institution, Tamaquag Museum, which is tamaquagmuseum.org. So I encourage you to visit those websites to learn more about this history. Okay, we can go to slide two. Okay, so I teach a course here at Brown that explores some of the lesser known histories of people um, whose experiences have uh, been marginalized in traditional tellings of American history. Um, and during the semester, uh, I take a, uh, my class on a short field trip to the main quad. And in the corner of the main quad, there exists this statue that you can see on your screen, a bronze statue of Bruno the Bear. Uh, the students have seen this statue many times uh, during their cross campus treks, uh, but few have given it uh, more attention than such like a passing glance. Um, even fewer have taken the time to read the inscription on the statue, uh, which says something about the invincibility of brown men. So maybe they're not missing too much, but still um, without fail, uh, almost none of the students have ever read the inscription on the back of the pedestal. And I know that you can't see it that well, but that's the picture to the right there, um, which explains that encapsulated in that box in the base is a piece of the slate rock, quote, on which Roger Williams landed when he came here in 1636 to hold forth his lively experiment of independence with strength and courage. Uh, close quote. 
So I bring my class here because it is an ideal location for students to consider in a deep and meaningful way, the durability of settler colonialist ideology. And reading the inscription, it would seem that Roger Williams arrived in a virgin land because the name of this place, Mashasuk, its people, the Narragansett, and their roles as exemplars of this lively experiment have all been erased and replaced by a mythology that reimagines the colonists as pioneers. And go to the next slide. At uh, Fox Point Park. Located Hi, Dr. Scott. Yeah. We just want to. We just want to interrupt for a minute. Your your sound is going in and out. Well, let me see if I can turn up the volume. Sorry. Sorry about that. Is that better? Uh, uh, is that better? No. No, it's just going in and out. I think as. <laughs> And like pull it closer. Is that better? No. I, I think it'll be hard to know until you talk for a little while. But I think if you're a little bit closer, that might help. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, yeah. Just let me know. At uh, Fox Point Park, located between Roger William Rogers and William Street, um, just a few blocks from where the bronze statue stands, uh, there's another monument. The inscription tells us. Uh, that it was here that Williams, quote, the apostle of liberty landed uh, and having, quote, a sense of God's merciful providence decided to call the place providence. Is the, does it sound any better? Um, it's still a little bit going in and out. <laughs> right, I'm sorry, I don't know what we can do about it. I can try to join on my phone if, that, if that's better. Yeah, maybe we should just pause for a moment. Okay, yeah, let's just, let me try to join the conversation. Sorry, everybody. Just really want to hear everything. While we're um, waiting, I'll just take a moment to share in the chat um, a few links that might be of interest. Um, so this first one is, um, just a moment, is a link to Dr. Scott's um, talk that he gave last year for the CSSJ, if you're interested in learning more about his scholarship. Um, and this event is also being recorded and once it's been edited, it will be available on the CSSJ's YouTube playlist. All right, I'm gonna try here. Is this better sound? Uh, maybe, are you, here, let me, I'm, I muted your video and can you try again? Okay, is this a uh, better sound? I'm sorry. Yes, it, it is. is. Okay, there we go. So uh, the part that you missed, basically, uh, what I was saying is that I bring my students to that bear next to the quad and on the in the back of the bear, it has uh, something about um, Roger Williams as being a, a founder of um, the ideas of liberty and in in, um, cased in the back of that bear is a piece of the slate rock. Um, and then at this park in uh, Fox Point is another piece of that slate rock, okay? Uh, so we'll continue from there. So uh, despite the fact that um, this story has been preserved in metal and stone, um, the providence that Williams enjoyed when he arrived in the Narragansett country did not come from God. It came from the hearts, hands, and minds of the Narragansett people. These two monuments are literally concrete examples of the durability of a mythology that celebrates and normalizes the erasure associated with settler colonialism. Roger Williams did not conjure providence from divine inspiration and sheer will. 
Instead, Rhode Island exists today because the Narragansett, who continue to call this state home, were here first. We can go to the next slide. There are a few enduring falsehoods that tend to obfuscate the centrality of indigenous peoples throughout the Dawnland. And say the Dawnland, we mean New England. Uh, since their arrival, English colonists proclaimed the Dawnland was a uh, vacuum domicilium or a vacant land that according to jurisprudence was free for the taking. In 1620, the English King James issued the charter for New England to replenish what he called a desert. Similarly, William Bradford, the governor of Plymouth Colony, famously retorted that, quote, the good hand of God, which favored our beginnings, uh, swept away great multitudes of the natives that, we might, that he might make room for us. In 1975, Francis Jennings expressed the durability of the vacant land narrative when he wrote that New England was a widowed land. But despite such claims, it took more than 100 years, and the death and dislocation associated with one of North America's deadliest conflicts for English colonists to achieve numerical superiority throughout the Dawnland. In fact, in the mid 17th century, the indigenous population in Rhode Island was um, or, or what was then called the Narragansett country was roughly double that of Manchester, England's second largest city. Go to the next slide. Bradford's colony was built upon land cleared and farmed by indigenous population, as was Boston and more than 50 other English colonial settlements. The fact is there was no vacant land in the Dawnland when the colonists arrived. Another falsehood communicated by the monuments on campus and at Fox Point Park is the idea that Williams arrived in a virgin land, a kind of tabula rasa, in need of a name and a place where he can conduct his lively experiment. But the Narragansett country was no blank slate and Providence already had a name. I have previously discussed uh, the conditions William encountered when he first arrived at Mishasa. And I will just say here that the landscape was one of the most productive and densely populated locations in the Dawnland. Even those lively experiments chroniclers have attributed to Williams were pre-existing social and political realities in the Narragansett country. In 1643, Williams wrote that, quote, they, the Narragansetts, have a modest religion persuasion, uh, not to disturb any man in their conscience and worship. Therefore, the Narragansett first provided the, quote, apostle of soul liberty with the haven that both supplied and fostered the quote, liberty of conscience uh, for which Williams is remembered. In the popular imagination, Williams is a venerable figure. He is remembered as the founder of Rhode Island and the progenitor of religious freedom. Throughout the state, his name and monuments remain prolific, but lost in all of this honorification is the fact that Williams was a refugee in desperate need of sustenance, support, and protection when he arrived in the Narragansett country. Knowing of Williams's pending arrest, John Winthrop, the governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony, advised uh, Williams to flee to the Narragansett country. It is likely that Winthrop made the recommendations for various reasons, but principally, because the Narragansett country was the only place in the Dawnland where the colonial magistrates could not pursue the fugitive. When Williams arrived in Narragansett country, perhaps landing on the slate rock that has been so carefully preserved and encased in those monuments, the Narragansett were the clear demographic and martial hegemon in the Dawnland. The fact that the Narragansett could place at least 3,000 warriors in battle at a moment's notice 
had kept the colonists at bay as they leapfrogged the Narragansett country to establish colonies in Connecticut. On the eve of William's arrival, there were no praying towns, missionaries, or anyone living in the Narragansett country who was not Narragansett. This is not to say that individuals did not travel in and out of the Narragansett country, because many did. The abundance of Mashasasuk attracted people from many communities, but those who wished to reside within the Narragansett country turned Narragansett regardless of their previous affiliations. According to Williams, when members of the Narragansett first welcomed him to their lands, they offered the salutation, what cheer Nita, or what is the good news friend? By referring to the newcomer as Nita, the Narragansetts communicated an intimacy that offered the refugee entry into their community. Years later, when recalling the hospitality he received from the Narragansett, Williams wrote that, it is a strange truth that a man shall generally find more free entertainment and refreshing amongst these barbarians, um, the Narragansett, than amongst those thousands that call themselves Christian. But as was true of the land upon which he settled, the entertainment and refreshing that Williams enjoyed was not free because members of the community reserved this generosity for Nita. The structure of the Narragansett Society included an interconnected system of reciprocity and obligation. All who lived within Narragansett country, including the newcomers, were expected to abide by certain social, economic, and diplomatic customs. Therefore, in accordance with their residency, Williams's indigenous benefactors considered the refugee and his companions to be part of their community. They were Nita, they were Narragansett. Williams recorded many examples of the intimate relationships forged between the newcomers uh, and their indigenous overlords. Williams wrote that he regularly lodged in the homes of indigenous persons, even sleeping in the same beds as his host. He also stated that he often entertained and sheltered native uh, his native neighbors in his own home. The refugee also uh, detailed some of the many diplomatic errands and numerous items of tribute he proffered to Narragansett sachems. In sum, Williams left a detailed account of the expectations and obligations that he met as Nita. Still, as he divulged to Winthrop, Williams did not consider himself to be Nita. In 1638, two years into his tenancy, uh, Williams wrote that, quote, I have not yet turned Indian. The admission was intended to reassure his friend that despite his exile, his allegiance remained with his, Eng with his English and not his indigenous country. It was the incongruity between the way that the Narragansett and Williams understood the refugees' residency in the Narragansett country more than any other factor that led to the creation of the, of the Rhode Island colony. It is important to remember that Williams's presence in the Narragansett country was not sanctioned by English colonial authorities. He had no permission, patent or charter to settle in the area. The, total the totality of his legitimacy came from the consent of the Narragansetts. In fact, the patent Williams obtained in 1643 referenced the conditions and circumstances of his residency in the Narragansett country, recording that the colonists had, quote, adventured into the territory, um, becoming neighbors and members of society with the great body of Narragansetts. In the document, the English parliament even posited that such cross-cultural unions may, quote, lay a sure foundation of happiness to all America. However, to legitimate and affirm their residency in the Narragansett country, Williams and his followers needed to declare their ownership 
of Mashasa Sun. The newcomers could not be interpreted as tenants beholden to the authority of indigenous sachems and received from parliament the authority to order, govern, uh, to order and govern their plantation. Therefore, Williams claimed proprietorship over Mashasa Sun. Uh, we can go to the next slide. One of the oldest documents held in Providence City archives is the 1638 deed in which Williams recorded his personal ownership of a stretch of land fronting a salt cove. Although neither of the indigenous signatories could read the document or write their names, Canonicus and my antinomy supposedly indicated their desire to forever relinquish what had been a central and abundant landscape by drawing a bow and arrow on the paper. It is a wonder why indigenous leaders almost universally selected a bow, arrow, or other instruments to sign uh, colonial documents when there were so many other symbols that were of much more social, cultural, and political significance. For instance, the wampum belts that native leaders gave to each other to affirm agreements featured uh, figures like the Thunderbird, which communicated sacredness. We can go to the next slide. What we can say for sure is that many indigenous persons maintained a very different understanding of the conditions governing European settlement. Still, the colonists affirmed their conceptions of permanent ownership in the deeds, titles, patents, and charters that they crafted. The 1643 patent did not record that Williams and his followers were refugees. It did not record that they were Nita. Instead, it recorded that they were owners who had purchased the land upon which they settled. Almost a quarter century later, Williams admitted that Canonicus, one of the principal sachems of the Narragansett, quote, was not I say to be stirred with money to sell his land, to let foreigners. Uh, Tis true, he received presents and gratuities, many of me, but it was not thousands nor 10,000s of money could have bought of him an English entrance into this bay. Still, the patent officially reframed the residency of the colonists in favor of the English tradition of deeded and perpetual proprietorship. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> In 1663, King Charles II granted a royal charter to Rhode Island settlers who did, quote, transplant themselves into the midst of the Indian natives who are, as we are informed, the most potent princes and people of all that country. Like the patent had done 20 years earlier, the charter claimed ownership over lands that the colonists did not hold dominion over. The territory outlined in the charter continued to be claimed and occupied by the still potent Narragansett. Therefore, if Rhode Islanders were going to claim the authority to govern themselves, they needed to once again reimagine themselves as owners and not as tenants not as Nita. The charter recorded that the lands subject to the agreement were, quote, seized and possessed by purchase and consent of the said natives to their full content. But again, as Williams later confessed, the land upon which the Rhode Islanders settled was not purchased. Consent, for their presence in the Narragansett country came solely from and under the authority of the Narragansett. There was no seizure in possession as the charter claims. Instead, the land was given freely to those deemed to be Nita. But Williams and the other newcomers had not yet turned Indian. The discord created by these very different interpretations of what residency in Rhode Island meant was communicated in the charter when it granted the colonists the authority to quote, upon just causes 
invade and destroy the native Indians. Given the fact that at the time the charter was written, the Narragansetts numbered between 15 and 20,000. It is highly unlikely that Rhode Island's 1,500 colonists could have accomplished much through efforts to invade and destroy their indigenous benefactors. Still, the provision revealed how much conceptions about the Narragansett country had evolved since the days of the, quote, sure foundation of happiness to all America envisioned in the patent. We can go to the next slide. To prepare, to, I'm sorry, to perhaps forestall um, the cross-cultural cross aggression that would lead to King Philip's war, the charter forbade the other New England colonies from invading and molesting the natives residing within the boundaries outlined in the agreement. However, this stipulation could be circumvented with, quote, the knowledge and consent of the governor and company of our colony of Rhode Island uh, and Providence Plantations. The provision would prove to be consequential because it offered the colonists the means by which to make New England their own. The tendency of the European settlers at Mashasasa likely followed a pattern of multiple agreements reaffirming the tributary and contingent status of newcomers. In 1638, the 1638 deed recorded that native peoples continued to plant, harvest, and reside in the same areas now inhabited by the refugees. Uh, quote, from Canonica's point of view, wrote a Williams biographer, the treaty of purchase did not bestow ownership, but only the right to settle on his land as his subjects. Similarly, the scholar Lisa Brooks explains that, quote, native leaders understood they were granting co-occupancy right to use the land with a particular, with a, within a particular territory, rather than permanent alienation of a bounded tract. However, as we have seen, Euro-American settlers proclaim perpetual and exclusive ownership in their patents, charters, and deeds. These contradictory interpretations of the land, residency, and ownership led to the outbreak of what is now often referred to as King Philip's War. Throughout the 1640s, the physical and social proximity between the Narragansett and the Europeans who settled among them was evident um, at, I'm gonna butcher this name, Kakos uh, Kako, but it's the trading voice known at today as Smith Castle, um, uh, which was in the seat of the Narragansett sachemship in present day Wickf Wickford, Rhode Island. It was here that William spent much of his time uh, trading, entertaining, and conversing with the natives. Even the reclusive uh, William Blackstone could be seen at um, this trading post, uh, pending, uh, peddling his famous apples. The trading post, which was created at the behest of the Narragansett, seemed to never close. Williams even complained that the Narragansett arrived too often and lingered too long. Um, though laborious, the hours and hospitality that Williams maintained at the trading post was emblematic of the Narragansett culture and an expectation of Netop. Williams explained that, quote, whoever cometh in when they, the Narragansetts, are eating, they offer them to eat, which they have. And if a stranger come in, they presently give him to eat what they have and at all times of the night. Because they continued to meet their obligations as Netop, Williams and the newcomers enjoyed almost four decades of peaceful settlement and protection in the Narragansett country. Almost 20 years after he first arrived, Williams asked his compatriots, quote, are not our families and towns grown up in peace amongst them, the Narragansett? In fact, because it was firmly within the jurisdiction of the Narragansett, Providence was one of the few colonial towns that the English never fortified. Still, when war erupted between the Wampanoag and Plymouth, it threatened to inflame all of the dawn. 
In June 1675, Narragansett leaders questioned Williams about why Rhode Island colonists appeared to support Plymouth when the greater Narragansett community declared neutrality. Williams explained to his indigenous benefactors that, quote, all the colonies were subject to one king. Therefore, one Englishman uh, to stand to death by each other in all parts of the world. The answer likely alarmed the Narragansett, who had pledged themselves to the same king. It was clear that Williams believed that a difference existed between the king's English subjects and his native ones. The Narragansett may have wondered if the former refugee now saw themselves as English subjects, independent and apart from their indigenous neighbors, or if this had always been the case. It was clear that King Philip's war held the potential to reorder relationships throughout the region. And it was true that some colonists, quote, actually relished the idea of finally attacking the Narragansett to seize their land. As discussed, the Charter of 1663 granted the colonists permission to invade and destroy the Narragansett, and the war created the opportunity for Euro-Americans to make a play for the Narragansett country. In fact, while fighting Metacom's forces throughout New England, the United Colonies remained focused on the threat posed by the Narragansett. Colonial leaders even promised their soldiers that, quote, if they played the man, took the fort and drove them out of the Narragansett country, which is their greatest seat. They should have a gratuity of land beside their wages. However, per the charter, the gratuities could only be realized if the Rhode Island colonists consented to the attack. But by December, 1676, even Williams, who owed his residency at Providence, and perhaps even his life to the generosity of native peoples now advocated for going to war against them. In a letter addressed to the governor of Connecticut, Williams wrote that, quote, I presume you are satisfied in the necessity of these present hostilities and that it is not possible at present to keep peace with these barbarous men of blood. We are as justly to be uh, repealed and subdued as wolves that assault the sheep. The letter was written on 18 December, 1775. The next day, more than 1,000 soldiers of the United Colonies marched into the Narragansett country and launched a preemptive attack on a group residing at a fort a few miles from the trading post in an area known as the Great Swamp. Contemporaries, even some modern chroniclers labeled the conflict the Great Swamp Fight. However, Narragansett oral history contends that the fort was akin to a refugee camp that housed women, children, and old men. The fact that the Narragansett used swamps as places of refugee, uh, as places of refuge, was well known. Williams even made note of this tradition, explaining that, quote, thick woods and swamps are refuges for women and children in war. Whether understood as a fight or a massacre, the attack remained the most significant, deadly intercolonial action undertaken by European Euro, Euro American colonists until they took up arms in what is now called the French and Indian War almost a century later. While few Rhode Islanders participated in the attack, many, including Richard Smith Jr., whose father had purchased the trading post from Williams, provided substantial aid, including transportation, accommodation, supplies, and information to the soldiers of the United Colonies. Although many warriors were not present during the attack, the deaths of hundreds of family members and the destruction of winter food stores proved disastrous for the Narragansett. We can go to the next slide. It is important to note while other European, while other Euro-American settlements were being assaulted and burned by Medicom's uh, supporters throughout the summer and fall of 1675, Rhode Island communities had been left unmolested. However, on 29 March, 
1676, three months after the attack at the Great Swamp, more than a thousand indigenous warriors arrived in Providence to evict the colonists and reclaim Mashasasa. Before they set fire to the town, Williams parlayed with Narragansett leaders and later recorded his interpretation of that exchange. Williams questioned the group as to why they assaulted us with burnings and killings. The Narragansett replied that the Rhode Islanders were their enemies now, joined with Massachusetts and Plymouth, entertaining, assisting, and guiding them. It was clear from the exchange that the Narragansett viewed their former tenants as co-conspirators in the attack. Therefore, the status of Neetop that Williams and the other settlers had enjoyed for four decades had been revoked. The Narragansetts reclaimed their land and the former refugees were sent fleeing once again as they watched their settlement burn to the ground. Eventually, the Narragansett, the Wampanoag and their allies were defeated. Williams and the other colonists returned to Providence and rebuilt their community, freed from their obligation as Nita. Future generations would remember Williams as the founder of Providence and forget that Mashasasuk ever existed. They would not remember that the place now called Rhode Island once served as America's best hope for a sure foundation of happiness to all. And they would not recall that it was the Narragansett who provided the Providence that Williams and his and the other colonists enjoyed uh, for close to half a century. These things are forgotten because this history was never preserved in metal and stone. Uh, thank you for uh, listening and suffering through the technical difficulties. I do appreciate it. So this piece is a um, part of a chapter and part of a piece that I will um, talk about uh, at a, in a, another uh, conference. So I'm really looking for any feedback um, any, any, anything that um, will help me to develop this further or, or think about um, avenues or lines of inquiry that I haven't thought of. So um, any, any questions, feedback is, is greatly appreciated. So thank you, Dr. Scott, for sharing your research with us. We have about 20 minutes now for questions. As a reminder, please put your questions into the chat or raise your hand and we will get to as many of them as we are able to in the time remaining. Um, I'm gonna call on Don Campbell. You can... Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, did uh, Archer Williams colony and the um, Rehoboth colony founded by Newman cooperate well or were they on completely different paths? I have... Uh, some curiosity about that, having had some ancient ancestor killed in Pierce's fight. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure to tell the truth. I know that um, Roger Williams and the Rhode Island colonies are, you know, almost one and the same. So we're talking about um, Warwick, Quidnick, um, but the, the relationship between Rhode Island and the other colonies, right? So Massachusetts Bay, Plymouth, and the Connecticut colonies is one where um, for a long time, they interpret um, the Rhode Island colony as a rogue colony, right? That they're, uh, they're a bunch of degenerates, right? A bunch of uh, godless uh, people um, and that they're under the protection of the Narragansett. So I don't know how much um, interaction there is until really this war. Obviously this interaction with Roger Williams as being a um, kind of like a, a go-between between the indigenous uh, community and um, certainly Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth. But uh, as far as the colonists themselves, I don't know how much interplay there is with those separate colonies. In fact, the United Colonies was created to exclude Rhode Island, right? So all of the colonies in New England joined together at the exclusion of Rhode Island. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Um, I have a question from Sherry Bodie. You can unmute and ask your question. Thank you. Um, hi, Dr. Scott. I have so many questions when it comes to the Great Swamp Massacre, um, but I will settle on one. Could you give clarity or even 
provide your perspective on the relationship between the Narragansett and the Niantic and the role that Ninigrit played during that time? Because I've read so many different conflicting stories. I would love to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, no, thank you for that question. It's a good question. Um, so I know that the way that Ninigrit is kind of um, discussed in the literature is um, more of a co-conspirator, more on the side of um, the, the colonists, right? And uh, I think that what ends up happening um, is that Ninigrit and the community that he's able to save, the Niantic, um, become the uh, refuge, right? Kind of like that, the swamp refuge, come, become the refuge for a lot of the indigenous communities that were at war. I don't think that there's a, like a really hard and clear distinctions as um, you know, a lot of the record says between indigenous groups, there's lots of back and forth and go between. And I, in, in my interpretation, um, Ninigrit decides to really kind of hold this place of neutrality um, as a way to preserve uh, his community. And um, it, obviously Narragansett is a part of that too. So I don't know if that really answers the question, but I see this is as a strategic choice in trying to really preserve this idea of the Ninigrit um, and the Niantic being neutral. The Narragansetts are neutral also, uh, but the attack is on the Narragansett for, and that changes things. Thank you. So. I have a question from Bethany Warbarton. Um, any thoughts on why with so much historical documentation, there's still so much opposition to viewing Roger Williams as he was historically. Um, so I don't know what I can say, but I guess how he's known historically. So there's a traditional, so I, I guess this is the way I'm interpreting the question. There's a traditional view, and this is not unique to Rhode Island, right? Where um, we tell these, these stories and these narratives that kind of are, explanatory, right? They kind of explain the conditions at present. And the conditions at present are that um, the Narragansett are kind of um, almost invisible in this state, right? So the story of um, Roger Williams coming and the Narragansett disappearing makes sense in an explanatory type history. And I think that that's part of it. Um, uh, there's um, Gene O'Brien, uh, does a, a, a has this book is called First Thing and Last Thing that talks a lot about the motivations for um, kind of erasing the native past and replacing it um, with the colonial past and where the colonials the colonists become the new natives right and they become the 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 people that have primacy rights to the land because everybody before them disappeared and I think that um, the the narrative that we see um, it captured in the stone and, and, and uh, metal on those monuments kind of fit um, our expectations, right? Or, or the way that we see. And I think that those other stories where they, you know, talk about it in a different way um, are hard to kind of, uh, I guess, uh, coordinate or, or, or um, make align with what we see um, today in Rhode Island and in our. Um, explanatory type histories. Thank you, Dr. Stott. Um, how has archaeology illuminated King Philip's War and Narragansett villages? That is a good question. Oh, oh, so King Philip's War. So this is a good question. Um, I, I know that um, there's, we don't know where the Great Swamp is, right? Uh, there's, there's some speculation about where it might be. So I know that there, that's not part of the um, archeological dig or, or, or findings. Um, I'm trying to think, I'm not, I don't know a lot about the archeological record, but I, I, the ones that I do know are of, um, you know, villages that date back thousands of years, right? So the, this idea of the, uh, the presence and permanence of the people that um, lived in this area. But as far as um, understanding for King Phil, so I know that there's um, a, a archaeological dig at the um, 
the site of the Pequot uh, massacre. But um, as far as for Rhode Island and the Narragansett villages, I'm, I'm not familiar with those, um, those surveys or those studies, if there are any. Thank you, Dr. Scott. How did um, Roger William claim, why did Roger William claim what he did? Was it bad faith? So this is, I, I really like that question. Um, I don't know, right? And I don't think anybody knows. I, I don't, I don't know if this was like an intentional thing. I do know that uh, colonial leaders understood uh, in an intimate way the, the politics and the diplomacy of indigenous peoples. They did, right? So when Roger Williams accepted um, residency and tenancy and protection from the Narragansett, he understood what that meant, right? He understood the obligations that were associated with that. I say that because um, there, there's examples of earlier times when um, some indigenous communities in Connecticut uh, went to um, William Bradford and John Winthrop and said, hey, come, come settle uh, this area in Connecticut. And they wrote and they understood exactly what was happening. They said that those, those uh, people that had invited them into Connecticut were doing so to lock them into obligations, right? To lock them into obligations to, to be able to defend them against the other indigenous communities that were in there. So from the beginning, they understand what these relationships mean. Um, and then obviously, Roger Williams says himself that uh, that he doesn't purchase the land, right? That he understands. And, and, he, and he, I think that he believes that he's meeting his obligations, right? He, he has the, the trading post, he, he's living uh, within these communities. Uh, 20 years later, he talks about, you know, how close the communities are. Um, but then the pressures that come from, um, you know, just the demographic change. I think that um, after the great migration and when the uh, colonists start to outnumber the, the indigenous peoples in, in uh, you know, significant ways, then power dynamics change too. And there's a whole nother aspect here that I didn't talk about in this, this talk is that, um, Rhode Island legitimacy, right, is at play too, right? That the the the, the other colonies, Massachusetts, is making plays on Rhode Island's territory. Right, they're trying to encroach on um, territory that's uh, claimed by Rhode Island. So there's there's that aspect too. So um, you know, I, I think that like most, like a lot of people, Roger Williams was a was a person. He was self interested. Um, he did things that he thought was going to be good for himself uh, and for the people that he considered his countrymen. And I don't think that um, he considered the indigenous population, his countrymen and the way that they considered him their country. Thank you, Dr. Scott. There's a question in the chat from uh, Sylvina Hernandez Duran, but I see she has her hands up. So if you'd like, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah. Um the question in the chat was if you could repeat the name of the book, but um, on what uh, you were just talking about um, uh, and in terms of sharing feedback as well, I think it would help to know more about the relationship the Narragansett had with the land and their cultural understanding of um, like their, their cultural understanding in general. Like, um, so I've learned a little bit more and just have seen even how many indigenous communities continue to um, relate to each other. So that like, um, you know, exchange of um, care and attention and like giving back to their own community, like taking care of their own, but also this, this notion of um, that the land isn't property. So that seems to, um, you know, really be at play here as well. Um, and I missed, I, I may have missed or, would have wanted to understand a little bit more of the the um, how Roger Williams came to uh, or had to it seems like seek refuge in Narragansett land. I don't think I I got that um, entirely either. Okay. It, well, thank you for the question. So the name of the book is uh, First Thing and Last Thing, uh, Gene O'Brien. Um, and then <clears throat> yes, so. Uh, I didn't really go into great detail about the um, relationship to the land. I gave a, a talk last year where I really talked about 
this area and, and what it meant to uh, the Narragansett people. Um, so I didn't want to go into that, but there's some good points, especially the relationships that did exist. So um, a lot of people kind of like in one of the questions that we answered a little bit earlier, think that there was like really these hard line distinctions or separations between the indigenous communities in this region. And there really wasn't, right? We have people going back and forth all the time between communities and being part of those communities. In fact, the justification for uh, the attack on the Great Swamp was that the Narragansetts were harboring um, uh, Wampanoag refugees, right? And that's what they're saying, right? So that there's, you know, so many connections between these communities. Um, and then the question about uh, Roger Williams needing to um, seek refuge, is that is that what you're saying? All right, so uh, when, when the colonial authorities uh, uh, you know, exile Roger Williams. Um, the The options are limited. I know that some people have written that there there were more options. I, I don't think that there really were. Um, the options were limited. The options for Roger Williams were um, to go back to England, uh, where he was most likely uh, would be jailed, right? If not killed, because his um, his, his ideas and his stance and his um, uh, you know, immovability on uh, his religious ideas were so contrary to what um, was acceptable in England at the time, it would have been difficult for him, right? He was advocating for complete separation from the English church, right? That's what he was condemning his, um, the people in Massachusetts and Plymouth for not doing, right? Not having that complete clear separation from the English church. Um, so I don't think he could have went back to, to England uh, realistically. Yeah. Sorry, so it was it was wanting to understand that point of like, why was he exiled? And so it seems like he didn't, so it wasn't like Roger Williams arrived to what is now Providence and Rhode Island, like from England. He he was settled elsewhere and was exiled. Yeah, I'm sorry that that wasn't clear. Yes, so he was settled in a couple of different places and he got kicked out of a couple of different places, right? So he was in Boston. Uh, when he arrived in Boston, they offered him the... Um, the, the uh, pulpit, uh, which was a really honored position. And he uh, turned it down condemning them, right? Saying that they were not a separated people, right? That he couldn't he couldn't uh, preach or he couldn't lead us unseparated people. And then he goes to um, uh, Salem, right? And he gets driven out of Salem. He goes to uh, Plymouth, he gets driven out of Plymouth. And uh, at this time he's starting to advocate for, uh, he's starting to call into question the entire authority um, that the Puritans had, right? Because there, there, there's not a separation. Not, and this is what Roger was known for. There's not a separation between the um, the religious aspect and the civil aspect, right? And he's starting to call that whole thing into question. He's also starting to call into question the authority that they have to even settle in the land because it's indigenous land, and that's what um, pushes him out. And uh, when he leaves, um, he needs to find a place where he's going to be able to be protected. And the only place in the Dawnland that could protect him was the Narragansett country because it was the only community that numerically and martially rivaled any of the colonies. Thank you. Um, how did disease affect the Narragansetts in the 17th century? Okay, good. I like that question too, because this is something that I'm working through right now. Um, so in 1524, um, Verrazano comes into this area, right? This is the first uh, mention of New England and indigenous peoples, right, that we have. It's an Italian explorer, and he comes into what today is known as Narragansett Bay. Um, he, he meets with these people, he interacts with these people, and then he leaves, right? Um, Right before the colonists come, uh, there is a plague. We're not sure exactly how it started or where it came from. Uh, it's, it's a European uh, you know, uh, disease that really does take a heavy toll on indigenous peoples throughout uh, New England. This is part of the reason why Francis Jennings is saying that it's a widowed land. But that plague doesn't really affect the Narragansetts at all. And I believe that part of that is because of those earlier interactions, right? We, that, that 1524 journey there, there might've been a plague after that. We just don't have the record of it, right? And there might've been some immunity built up within that community at that time. But whatever the reason is, 
Um, the Narragansetts didn't fall uh, prey to the plague like the Wampanoag did, like the Massachusetts did. And what that meant was the power dynamics within the Dawnland were in flux right when the colonists arrived, right? Um, the Narragansetts were the new hegemon when before they hadn't been, right? They, they, they had been kind of um, an equilibrium between all of those different indigenous groups where they had their, their territory, their land, and they kind of were, were equalized um, out in that way. But right when they came, the Narragansetts were subject, they were an expanding power. They were subjecting the Wampanoag, right? They were working to subject the Massachusetts. And the Massachusetts and the Wampanoag were biting together against the Narragansett. And that's kind of the, um, the effect of disease at this time, right? That they, it really did kind of change the, the um, power dynamics in New England when the colonists arrived. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Um, here's another question. How do we disrupt and correct the false narratives of discovery and colonization? And how do we make the public um, recall the truth? Yeah, so yes, please tell me the answer. No, I'm just joking. But yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I think that part of it is, I mean, I know that it's kind of, um, antiquated to put up monuments and things like that in, in these days, but the monuments that we do have, maybe we should, um, you know, add more of the story to them, right? Put, put other things there that explain that, you know, Roger Williams didn't arrive in a virgin vacant land, right? That there were people here and that a lot of the things that he was able to do was because there were people here. Um, I think that, you know, being part of the curriculum would be a big deal. Right now in Rhode Island, there, uh, there's no mandate, there's no, um, you know, piece of indigenous history in the curriculum. Right, we had the um, social justice movement in 2020, and Rhode Island lawmakers decided that they wanted to, uh, you know, expand the curriculum. Right, which is a great thing. We wanted to look at the the historical injustices, which is a great thing. But then they limited it to people of African descent and um, people of um, Pacific Island, right, Asian Pacific Island descent, and didn't put the uh, indigenous peoples in there at all. Right, so part of it too. I mean, we just have to. Um, think it's important to tell those stories in a way that it wasn't important for us before. Thank you. Uh, Lenora has her hand up. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask her a question, please? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Mac. This is a terrific, terrific work. Thank you very, very much. Um, I have more of a comment than, than a question, maybe, but I really want to hear your, your opinion on this. So, uh, going back to the construction of Roger Williams as an historical figure, um, I mean, this um, this idea, this representation of him as uh, um, someone who arrives to a virgin land and brings uh, civilization uh, really goes uh, goes long in time to, for example, the 20th century. And what I've seen studying the records of the Indian uh, Industrial School of Carlisle is that in the main publications of the school uh, that were publications made by faculty and the government superintendents for to Indian affairs, uh, Roger Williams really recurs. Um, as much as articles about his role um, within the Narragansett people. And uh, one example is an article uh, on the magazine, The Red Man. The article is titled uh, Roger Williams and the Narragansett. And this is 1916. So we are really you know, hundreds of years uh, after what happened and still talking about Roger Williams in this way in, within an educational system. Um, therefore, I guess my question is, would you somehow think it's relevant to what you are uh, putting together to your work to also look at these records or do you have an idea of how to incorporate them? Or do you think it will be important? And thank you so much again. Um, yes, thank you for the question. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I think what what happens is, um, and we, we, a lot of you probably know that there's this mythology about the natural disappearance of indigenous peoples, right? The, the myth of the vanishing Indian. And I think that 
Roger Williams, the story of Roger Williams really helps to perpetuate that narrative, right? This idea that he had been an advocate for the indigenous people, right? That he had, uh, you know, he got exiled from, uh, from Massachusetts Bay in Plymouth because he had advocated for the rights of indigenous peoples to their land, right? That, that's part of the narrative. Um, that he had come and he had supported, that he had um, gone in between, he had acted as a emissary and a diplomat and really advocate for indigenous um, rights and indigenous um, uh, uh, ways of being. But it didn't matter, right? It didn't, it didn't, it didn't work. And in the end, Rhode Island becomes uh, colonized and run by colonists and the Narragansett disappear. So in telling that story, we get to tell that story of inevitability, right? That this is kind of like a natural thing that, that these people just, you know, weren't part of that future um, that is part of Rhode Island and part of the United States today. And uh, I think that that uh, Roger Williams story, the way that we remember it, really helps us to perpetuate that, that mythology. So, um, yeah, I think that's why it's being used in the 20th century, and it's all part of this, this story, yes. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. This has been a great discussion, and thank you again, Dr. Max Scott, for the presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we hope to see you at other upcoming CSSJ presentations. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone.